So we're about to look at cofactor expansion, which is one way to compute determinants. going to start by writing the formula down. So you need a square major, major C. So we'll take our coefficients to be real. Well, actually, it could be any field. So I'll just put capital F here. Where F could be one of three could be real, could be complex, or it could be ZP. So we write vertical bars, that means determinant. So I'm going to write it with a sigma notation here. All right, easy formula, no problem. And this is going to be using row i. Or I should, well, let me be more specific, expanding across row i. All right, so let's read what's going on here. So this a little aij right here. That means entry in column in row I column J. So that's right here in row I column J. So that's whatever numbers in row I column J. Negative one to the I plus J. What that does, it's either going to be positive one or negative one, depending on if I plus J is even or odd. So let's say we're in row one, column one. So that's the upper left position. Do we have positive or negative in one, one position? Positive. positive. One plus one is two, two is even, negative one to the second power, it's positive. All right, what about, so we get positive right there. What about if I'm in the next position over? So that would be row one, column two. That'd be negative. And if I keep moving over another column, still in row one, it's going to alternate signs. Oh, look at that. That's our sign matrix right there. And if I drop down to uh, row two, so we had a positive in position one, one. If I drop down one position to row two, column one, I'll have negative. And if I keep going downwards, positive, negative, et cetera, et cetera. So you should see it alternate signs, just like our sign matrix. So that negative one to the power, this alternate signs. As in the sign matrix. All right, last piece. When did I use a capital with two subscripts? The determinant of the submatrix. So matrix minor. So what we're looking at right there is a minor matrix where we're going to remove uh, row I, column J. So that's a minor. So with row I, column J removed. All right, so that's all three pieces in this product. What does this big sigma outside do? Sum. So that's a sum, and j is going to be the variable that changes for each term. So j starts at 1, then 2, then 3, all the way up to n. So what this represents, we're going across row i, getting the minors, multiplying by the coefficients, and then either positive 1 or negative 1. So the signs will alternate. So that's what we're looking at right here. So that means sum. <coughs> All right, so we're ready to do an example. So 
So our matrix A is going to be 5, negative 3, 2, 1, 0, 2, 2, negative 1, 3. We can pick which row to go across, but because this is our first, I'm just going to pick row 1. Keep it easy. So I'm just going to circle row 1. So we're going to expand across row 1 here. I am going to use the formula at the top of the board, but I'm not going to look at it while I use it. So I'm just going to show you how to use it without really paying attention to it. So we need a sign matrix. The sign matrix needs to be three by three. And we are going across row one. So I'm going to highlight row one. All right, determinant of A equals, so it's gonna be a sum. The first sign is positive. So it's gonna be a positive one times, so right now we are looking at the first entry there. So we're in the first entry in row one. Now I wanna take the minor that has row one column one removed. So those are coefficient. Now the determinant of the minor, zero, two, negative one, three. So I just looked at the where the first entry is at five and we're taking out the row and column that five is in. So we're left with that bottom right matrix there. So that's our first term in the sum that would correspond to in that summation j equals one right there. So that'd be the j equals one term. Now we're going for the next term. So looking in the sign matrix, I now have a negative one. So this will alternate signs. Now there's a negative three is the coefficient. And now I'm going to circle that negative three. So we want to eliminate row one and now column two. So we're getting the sub matrix which is one, two, two, three. Any questions on that, on that term there? So last up, we're going for the two. So we have a positive one times two times the determinant of one, zero, two, negative one. So any questions on that third piece right there? Now all you need is a two by two determinant, so I'll just write that over here. So it's the two diagonals multiplied and then subtracted. Just make sure when you're going up to the right, that's gonna be the subtracted part. So we have five times zero minus negative two plus three times three minus four plus two times negative one plus zero. We have five times two, we'll just skip that step right as 10. Three times negative one is minus three. Two times negative one is minus two. And we have five for the determinant. All right, any questions on that determinant there? Now, on the determinant, 
that formula, I'll scroll back down in a second, you can pick whatever row you want, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. That means I can pick any row and I can compute the determinant on that row. And the determinant should not change depending on what row you use. You should always, in the, our case, get five for this matrix. So what we're going to do is pick another row and recompute it. And we better get five at the end. So pick row two. I'll rewrite the matrix and then highlight row two. And when you're doing this, I strongly recommend that you circle or highlight the row you're using. Don't also highlight the column with a pen or pencil. Use like a, well, use your finger or a pen or pencil to cover it up, but don't actually write on the column because you can't erase as easily as I can. So just use your finger to cover up the column that you're working on. So what does our sign matrix say to start with? Negative. negative. So we're in row two, column one. So make sure it's going to be negative. Positive one plus negative one. All right, so I'm leaving U space to fill in the matrix minors and the coefficients. But I, all I did was take care of the sign and the general layout. So if you're stuck, it's a good time to ask any questions you have. screwed up this time. Pretty sure we did not screw up last time. Why can I cancel or just cross out my second term here? Because it's time zero. So I don't need to spend my time computing that determinant because that number, whatever it is, is going to be multiplied by zero and then become zero. Should have had seven plus zero minus two, which will give you five. So, any questions on that? 
All right, we could go on row three and recompute it, and we should get five. You can also pick any column, so you're not limited to rows. The way I wrote that formula out was by uh, pick a row and go across a row, but it works just as well if you pick a column and go across the column. All you have to do if you want to pick a column, you're just going to put an I here, and then you're going across column J. So you're just switching your indexes, basically. So I don't want to rewrite the formula out. That will take too long. So we'll just leave it the way it is. Uh, you, I had to look up how to write the formula down, but I could have computed a determinant without the formula. So as long as you compute enough determinants, I, I would not even put this formula on my cheat sheet. I would just know how to compute determinants because this is anytime you're using subscripts, uh, it can be quite confusing. So I recommend just comp do enough homework problems or practice problems. You don't have to uh, look back at the formula. So let's do a Z7 example. So we're going to be given a matrix. We'll go B in mat 4 by 4 across Z7. So just recall Z7. I'm going to write out all the elements in Z7. So there's seven elements, 0 through 6. Just remember 7 is 0, 8 is 1, 9 is 2, etc, etc, etc. So I'm just writing down the numbers here because you have to keep your entries between 0 and 6. So you can't go outside of that range. All right, we're going to be computing when B is 2401, all right, we can pick the row or column. There is one, there's actually two choices that would be better than all other choices. So if we're going rows, what's the best row to pick? The bottom row. Bottom row, I agree. Why is the bottom row, we can pick any row, but why is the bottom row the best row? Two zeros. Two zeros, so that saves us a lot of work. If we were going columns, what's the best column? Three, column three. Column three. So, why is column three even better? Three zeros. Three zeros, so that's a lot less work. Let's go down column three. So we need our sine matrix. This needs to be a four by four. You can be lazy and write out the minimal number of signs you're going to need. So all I did was just enough so I could cover column, four, uh, column three with pluses and minuses. So. Yeah, I could fill in the other two areas right there, but they're not relevant to what we're doing here. So I don't need to fill in those two. Of course, I'm only saving like eight seconds or something. But that's all you really need in your sign matrix right there. So now ready for determinant of B. So we're going down this column. So I have zero. It's positive zero. Now it's going to be plus negative one. Now, I already have done something illegal. Negative 1 is not on my list of elements in Z7. So what is negative 1? 6. Negative 1 is 6. It's the thing that adds to 1 and gives you 0. So it's the additive inverse of 1. I'll write that down. Negative 1 equals 6. No problem. So negative 1 has a property. When I add 1 to it, I get 0. So of course, if you add 1 to 6, you get 0. All right, so I'll fix that on the next, uh, the next line. So we are crossing out row 2. So I have 2, 4, 1, five, uh, no, 1, 6, 3. And then three one zero. Now 
I have plus 1 times 0 times I don't care, plus negative 1 times 0 times I don't care. Because again, those are multiplied by 0. So we don't need to worry about those determinants showing up. So negative 1 is really 6. 6 times 2 is 12, which is 5? No. 5? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So negative 1 times 2 is 5. So all I did was basically discard those zeros, multiply negative 1 times 2, which is 5. All right, what do we do next? So we got 3 by 3. How do we get determinant? Row expansion or column expansion, your choice. So let's go, we did column last time, let's go row this time. So obvious row is row three. Now remember when you do this, you're gonna have five times whatever this determinant that you get here. You have that coefficient that was already there. So it's gonna be five times whatever you get over here. So I'm gonna let you do the expansion here. And just remember, negative 1 is 6. So do this row expansion. You only get the first two terms. The last term will be 0. And don't forget your sign matrix. So make sure you bring your sign matrix in.
questions? What would negative nine be? So negative nine and Z seven. So that would be the number that I would add to nine to give you zero. So negative nine is the additive inverse of regular nine. Now regular nine is not a number we have, but it's the thing that would add to two to give you zero. Also known as five. So I technically wrote something down slightly incorrect. Twelve is not a number I'm allowed to write down. So that should have been negative, or not negative two, two. No, not two. Five. What is twelve? Twelve sevenths is seven sevenths and five sevenths. So that really should have been written as a five. Uh, the other thing, there's no such thing as subtraction. So technically, the six minus one that really should be a six plus six right there, to be fully correct. Uh, and that 12 minus 6, negative 6 is really positive 1. So that's the same as, to be correct, negative 6 is 1, and 12 we just said was 5. So 5 plus 1 is 6 right there. Good news is, it doesn't matter really when you reduce it down, you'll get the same answer as long as you're careful in your arithmetic. <coughs> So ready for a theorem? The determinant of a triangular matrix is the product of the entries in the diagonal. So there are two types of triangle matrices. The first one we saw was upper triangle. That was the matrix where all the non-zero entries were in the upper right triangle. The other triangle matrix that we saw was a lower triangle matrix when we did factorization. They look like that. And what this theorem says, all you have to do is look on the diagonal and whatever those numbers are, the product of those numbers are your determinant. There are two other kinds of triangle matrices we don't really look at so much. Let's see. They would look like this. That would be an upper left triangle. And the other one would be a lower right triangle. So those have the same property, although we don't, they don't show up very often the way that we use matrices. So I'm just writing them out for completeness. So you would just look on those diagonals, and that product would be the determinant. All right, what is the determinant of every identity matrix? It is one, because it's the product of all those ones. So those are super easy. Let's look for some easy determinants. Determinant of i, no matter what dimension you're in, every single one will be 1. Uh, let's see. Let's look at elementary matrices. Actually, let's look at some rules first, then we'll come back to elementary matrices. So these are determinant properties. So if A has an entire row of zeros, you just saw how to compute the determinant. 
what would the determinant be if you expanded across that row of zeros? It would be all zeros added together, giving you zero. Now, if you have a, a zero row or a zero column, you could use column expansion to go down your column of zeros and get zeros also. Uh, so a, if A is a, ro a zero row or zero column, then determinant of A equals zero. So if B is A with one row swap, then determinant of B is equal to negative determinant of A. So what this means, if you swap rows, your determinant becomes negative. So here's perfect time to see why this is not absolute value. That wouldn't make any sense if this is absolute value. So determinants can very easily be negative. I think ours, the only real example we did, we did a Z7 example, but every number in Z7 is positive. So it's not a good example to point to to say there's negative uh, determinants. Um, but we got five, could have barely, very easily gotten negative values. It just happened that positives were bigger more uh, more magnitude than the negative values, but it's very easy to get negatives from determinants. So don't think your determinant should be positive. It can very easily be negative. And if you do a row swap, your determinant changes sign. So if A has two identical rows or two identical columns, then determinant of A is equal to zero. If B is obtained from A by multiplying one row or one column, by alpha, then determinant of B is equal to alpha times determinant of A. Now it's a little strange, alpha does not get an absolute value on it. So if alpha is negative, it will show up as negative. And last up, if B is obtained from A by adding a multiple of one, by adding a non zero multiple. of one row to another. Then the determinant is, does not change. So I'm gonna highlight two of the, or three of these with a purple marker here. So these three are highlighted, what do they correspond to? Those are the three row operations that we've done. The only three row operations that there are. So what this tells you is how row operations affect determinant. So the good news is the most popular row operation, the one at the bottom, adding a multiple of one row to another, preserves your determinant. So only doing swaps and multiplying by a constant, those are the only ones that change your determinant. So 
those three are row operations right there. So use the determinant properties to find these determinants. So do not compute, but use all the properties above to find these determinants. They should be pretty easy to compute, but we're not computing them, use the properties. Alright, first matrix. What is our determinant? 3. And that was the second to last property. So this is almost the identity, except you multiply row 1 by 3. So it's 3 times the determinant of identity. So we're going to get 3 for the first one. What about the second matrix? 1. What property did you use for that? We're going to use property four here. We mul nope. Property five, the last property. So this is the identity, but adding three row one to row two. So that three will not affect the determinant. All right, next matrix. Why is this negative one? So one row swap gives you negative one. So it's the identity with one row swap. So it's negative determinant of the identity. All right, now I have a tricky one. How can we figure out the last one? Is it really two row swaps? We have to count rows. How many row swaps are we away from the identity? I'd say we're two or, or more. So let's figure out how many row swaps away we are. So I think row, no, none of the rows are where they should be. So we're going to have to make some swaps. All right, so I want you to determine how many swaps to get the identity. So do, you can do one or two swaps at a time, but figure out how many swaps to get to the identity. And it really matters, are you even number of swaps or odd number of swaps? That's really all that matters here. So it's probably going to be somewhere between two and, well, you could do it with like 75 swaps if you wanted to, or 76 swaps. but. Choose the most reasonable number of swaps that you can see. So I did it in three swaps. You could have done it in five swaps, or seven swaps, or nine swaps, or 309 swaps. But probably three or five would be the reasonable number of swaps. So either way, we're an odd number of swaps away from the identity. So we're going to get the term as negative one. Could you do it at one by switching one and three? So just the ones on the other diagonal? Yes. Yeah, so if we did one and three that way, we would go, let's see. What rule would we use to get this determinant? <coughs> so we're quite a few swaps from the identity here, unfortunately. So I'm still, I'd have, to, I'd have a few steps to get to the identity. 
Uh, we've done one row swap, so I can tell it's an even number of row swaps to hit the identity. So it's either two or four. But what rule can I use? So we have a triangle matrix. It's weird because we have zeros. We have whichever one of these, wait, we have whichever one of these two you want to think about because we have zeros in the upper and lower triangle right there. So we have either of those two cases. So that means our determinant is one, except we're, so this determinant is one, but when we rewind, we're one row swap away from what we wanted. So it's negative what we get here. So that terminal will be negative one. So with determinants, there is lots of choices on how you want to compute it. And you can do some row operations, keep track of the operations you performed, so you have an easy determinant, like a diagonal matrix, and then you can multiply the diagonals and then decide, all right, what, how do my row operations affect my determinant? So I made a row swap and uh, multiply by this constant, so I have to undo those things. All right, so we have a, another algebraic theorem here. So the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. And this only works, so you needed square matrices in order to have a determinant. So it means A and B have to be square, but if you're gonna multiply A and B, what has to be true also? So they have to both be squares and their inner dimensions match, so they have to be squared of the same dimension. So you can't have an N by N multiplied by an m by m. It had to both be the same square dimensions. So all dimensions must match. So next up, A is invertible. Exactly when determinant is not zero. Now, when we see the word invertible, remember that is a multiplicative inverse. So this works just like numbers. What kind of real numbers do not have a multiplicative inverse? All numbers whose absolute value is equal to zero, which includes only the number zero. So all numbers whose absolute value are zero have no multiplicative inverse. Just like all square matrices whose determinant is not zero have no inverse no multiplicative inverse. Everybody gets an additive inverse, you just put in negative entries and that's your additive inverse. Uh, but multiplicatively, that's a different story. So we know a matrix is invertible. If you just compute the determinant, if it is zero, you are not invertible. So a non-invertible matrix is called singular. So just think of the word singular, there's no other matrix to pair it up with, no other inverse it gets paired up with. So it's by itself. All right, so we're ready for some more determinant properties.
So scalar multiplication you don't get to just bring the scalar outside, you have to bring it outside raised to the nth power. So why is that? Because when you multiply a scalar by a matrix, every row gets multiplied by alpha. So there's n rows, so there'll be n rows multiplied by alpha. So that's why it's alpha to the n. All right, for a inverse, Let's think of the way, uh, if A is invertible, what would A times A inverse equal? Identity. Identity. So now I'm going to apply the determinant to everything here. And I'm going to use the determinant multiplicative property. And what is the determinant of identity? One. So this will have, this will be true as long as determinant's not zero. Determinant's zero, can't multiply and make one. So as long as your determinant's not zero, the inverse determinant will be one over determinant of A. So it'll be the reciprocal. And again, that only makes sense when A inverse exists, which is the same thing as saying the determinant of A is not zero. So those all have to happen. If I raise a matrix to the k power, that's determinant raised to the k power. And transpose determinant doesn't change because all transpose does turns rows into columns. So instead of expanding across a row, the transpose, if you did the same computation, you'd be expanding across a column. So transposing doesn't affect your determinant at all. <coughs> 